welcome to another fantastic episode of RFRX. My name is Eric Wells, and I am the support group director for Recovering from Religion. And with me today, his first time hosting is Rob Palmer. And Rob is a Recovering from Religion helpline agent, as well as an RFRX presenter himself. Welcome, Rob. Thank you very much. I'm also part of the ambassador program, working for Gale in that uh, capacity, trying to advertise to RFR all over the interwebs. Folks, at the beginning of every RFRX, we have a poll, and today is no different. These questions are kind of designed to get you in the mindset of what we're going to be talking about today. And so we've got four questions. The first is holidays are the worst. Yes, no, or obviously yes. Question number two, I feel disconnected from others during holidays. And you've got all of the time, some of the time neutral, sometimes or not at all. Question number three, I actively seek to find my own meaning in holidays, all the time, sometime neutral, sometimes, or not at all. And question number four, what is my favorite holiday? And we've got a list of them uh, here. So that poll will be running while we're doing this whole introduction. And um, we're gonna close it down once we start to read the bio for and introduce our guest. So Rob, why don't you start us off? We've here for RFRX, but what the heck is RFRX to, anyways? What is RFRX? Well, people should know by now after 80 something meetings, but I will say it anyway for the new people. It's what we call our weekly meetings that are held every Monday. And it's uh, where we host guests who discuss topics relevant to the folks in this community. It's not a replacement for the online community or our support groups. Uh, but you'll hear about those momentarily. Uh, these talks and presentations aim to provide a good information, advice, or coping skills. And uh, pertinent questions and comments, inquiries can be sent via email, and that'll be put in the chat to the uh, location where you can find the email address. And also, all previous recordings from these sessions can be found on our YouTube channel. And we're up to, like I said, about 80 now. It's amazing. Yeah, we're, we're closing on, on 100. And I don't know who's going to be number 100, but I, I think I need to start figuring it out. We need a big celebration special. on the, cent the Sentinel, whatever that would be. Yes, the 100. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, we have been slinging around the initialism RFR for a while, but what does that mean? RFR, it stands for Recovering from Religion. And here at Recovering from Religion, we have a mission statement. And our mission is to offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And so you kind of heard those three different things, hope, healing, and support. And we have designed and created fantastic programs to pursue, pursue each one of those directives, each one of those words. Um, so let's start off with healing. Rob, how yes. is RFR providing healing? That's very important. Uh, so we have the helpline that offers 24-7 support, and that's either via text chat or phone calls from anywhere on the planet. Um, you can even schedule a chat. Uh, if, if, you know, we try to pick up all the phone calls and get all the chats, but we're not 100% successful. So we offer the option to go in and schedule uh, a callback at, at a time convenient to you. And you can find that on our main site, recoveringfromreligion.org. Uh, volunteers like me offer empathetic support without judgment or criticism. And we suggest resources that will help you with your problem um, and coping. So, and those are also directly available to anyone who looks at our resource page. Excellent. Now we also mentioned hope and hope is uh, where we can uh, kind of start to see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, in a good way, not at the end of life type of way. But uh, this is where um, hope can get provided when we um, share or we listen to personal stories, because if somebody got through something very similar that I'm struggling with now, uh, it'll give me hope. It'll like, okay, if this person can do it, then perhaps I can get through it too. You know, we're all kind of in this together and no man, no woman, no person is an island. And, uh, and, we, and a lot of the stuff that we experience has been experienced by other people. So the, the sharing and the, the listening is really key to what we're about here at RFR and really key to providing that hope. So with that hope, we've got a blog and a podcast the podcast right now has a lot of the RFRX stuff in it, but some of the older episodes has some stories that can that people share their own struggles and uh, 
uh, victories with. Um, but we also have a fantastic blog that continues to share and uh, post incredible stories. Uh, I would recommend you check out medium.com slash excommunications to take a look at our blog. Now, we also have support, the whole support part of it. And this is my favorite part. Yeah, I, I was going to take. The, I was going to take and talk about it, Eric. But like you would have cried, so I just left it for you to talk about. I would have put myself on mute and grabbed my box of Kleenexes and just cried into it as you we were mangling the support groups program. <laughs> uh, you stay in your lane, helpline agent. <laughs> no, uh, so I'm the support group director. I love the support groups. It's kind of where I cut my teeth with recovering from religion. Um, these are where we get to meet face to face. And, uh, you know, uh, this is where we get to meet face to face and we can share our stories, share what's been going on. And it's a safe space for people to talk about this, talk about the trauma, talk about the doubts, talk about the struggles that they have and um, share with one another. Uh, and it's, it's an empathy, a place where people can share empathy and listen to what people have to say. Many times when we're struggling with doubts or we're struggling with trauma, the religious community that we're in may not be welcoming and may not, you may not feel comfortable enough to share those kinds of things. And so that's why we have set up the support groups. You can, we have right now 62 around the world. And uh, by the end of the week, probably going to add one or two more. Uh, and you can find all of those uh, that are available at Recovering, at, uh, recovering from Religion website. We have a virtual group that um, kind of is only virtual. Most of all of the groups right now are meeting over Zoom, but we have a specific one that is designed that will be purely virtual and also help in the uh, markets or the places like uh, Europe and Asia where we don't have a lot of groups. And so those are timed to coincide with people in Europe or in Africa or in Asia. Um, next is the Secular Therapy Project. Rob, you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm constantly referring people who call into the helpline to this. So, you know, it's a very important thing. Um, this is, it, it is amazing how many people tell me that, yes, they've been to therapy, but they quit because the person told them that, you know, they need to get right with Jesus or let's, you know, read from the Bible to help your marriage. So, uh, you know, the Secular Therapy Project was created by Dr. Delray, you know, to have uh, the alternative to that. Uh, this way you can connect with a licensed secular mental health care provider and they're carefully screened to match the following criteria. They need to be appropriately licensed in their state or country, of course, but also that they maintain a secular practice. So there's no religious proselytizing and they exclusively use evidence-based treatments. And uh, the next thing we can talk about is our wonderful online community, which is one of the latest things that RFR added. And now it's a thriving community. We have many, many channels where people discuss all sorts of things they have in common. Some of them are based upon an ex-religion. Some of them are topics like LGBTQ um, or Black non-believers, right? It's an online platform to meet people with similar backgrounds. Uh, there, if you're in there, you'll see the notices about our weekly Zoom hangouts, which has been recently every Friday for two hours. There's no speaker, but you just get to come in and chat. And, uh, you know, you can also, you know, join it and contact our helpline agents. If you're interested in that community, we will only allow people who've called in or chatted in and basically told their story. So we kind of vet people because we keep it very private. We don't want trolls in there and we moderate it pretty heavily. So to join that community, you need to either call or chat in and uh, tell an agent that you know about it and we'd like to discuss it. Rob talked about the online community. Now, that is a great place to meet people if you're kind of still in the closet. Uh, but if you are out and you want to make, a, uh, make some great friends, I would recommend finding the Atheist Community of Discord. And this is a fantastic place to meet, uh, meet, meet some friends, meet some uh, like-minded folks. And uh, so take a look at the Atheist Community of Discord, if you will. Now, volunteering. Everybody you see here, we are all volunteers for the Recovering from Religion. We are all behind the mission and we want to see it pursue. Uh, and in fact, we probably want to see ourselves worked out of a job or worked out of a volunteering position. It has been so great for me to be volunteering for the last, uh, I don't know, five, six years. I have gotten 
way more out of it than I've ever put into it. I've um, it, it's helped to pursue the purpose of my life and it's given it meaning. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other things that give my life meaning, but this is uh, a, a big one of them. Uh, if, if you have got some time, if you've got the inclination, if you feel ready to kind of give back, then we are always looking for some volunteers. So I'm going to drop a link into the chat for the volunteer. Next up, here's what to expect today. We kind of gone through the intro, but let's tell you what to expect. We've got the meeting format and it uh, the first part is going to be about a one hour discussion with our amazing guest. This is the fifth time he's been here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, after that, we're gonna have a Q&A session for about 20 to 30 minutes. So during the discussion, if you have some questions, which you probably will be, or will please type them into the chat. We're going to collect them all and uh, ask him during this Q and A session. Um, that goes for you too, Atheist Community Discord, because right now they're streaming this program into their Discord channel, and we're monitoring it. Um, once we're all done with the Q and A session, then we're going to have some closing thoughts by our amazing, incredibly intelligent executive director, Gail Jordan. Uh, she's going to wrap it all up for us. And after that, we're going to shut the recording off and just hang out. Hopefully, our guest has got some time to hang out with us and answer some follow-up questions or just, you know, share. This is a time where we can get to connect with one another. Um, uh, like I said, ask some follow-up questions and uh, just kind of share what's been going on for us. It's been incredibly popular and such a, a great, great feature that we have with RFRX. So without further ado, Rob, who the heck is joining us today? Well, everybody might know him from his four previous appearances on RFRX, but David is an educator and trainer for health providers and other professionals. Uh, he also has a private practice help, helping adults and couples with learning resiliency skills related to relationship difficulties and trauma. He hosts a podcast, Humanities of Values, and a blog related to mental health topics. Uh, David Teachout has worked in mental health care for 15 years and holds a master's in both forensic and counseling psychology. And he's currently working towards a doctor of psychology in clinical psychology. Maybe he can explain what that means to us. He's also worked in community mental health, social work, criminal justice, elder care, and child advocacy. What has he not worked in? Welcome back, David. Thank you, Rob. I, I'm not sure I haven't. Um worked at anything that I haven't, it's weird. <laughs> it's basically every single demographic that out there is, I've yeah, worked with, it's been, it's been actually <laughs> incredible. I, I, I love people, so. Well, um, so David, what are we talking about today? What's, uh, what's the deal yeah. with, with this? So yeah, um, thank you everybody for filling out the polls. Um, I, I figure the first one is my attempt at a Fox News poll. Uh, that way the answers are weighted. Um, so yeah, uh, what's funny though is that <laughs> as sometimes happens even on Fox News, um, it, it didn't go quite the way I expected because the no's still outweighed the yeses, even though there were two options to go there. So let's go ahead and share the poll results and go through them. Does yeah. that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the first question: Holidays are the worst. Most of the people, like David said, said no. 56% said no, they're not the worst. Yeah. Um, if I had answered this uh, even two, three years ago, I would have definitely said, yes, it's absolutely the, the, the worst. And only 16% said obviously yes. And another 28% said yes. So, uh, and then question number two is um, feeling, is it a feeling of disconnection during the holidays? Uh, 46%, which is the, the highest, said some of the time, um, and uh, only 4% said not at all. Uh, uh, any thoughts on that, David? I think uh, that one is less surprising, um, you know, that uh, people are, are feeling, in fact, you know, I feel disconnected, mm -hmm. which essentially is looking at, um, you know, the vast majority are either all the time or some of the time feeling disconnected, and which is, Good for today's talk, because that is very much what we are going to be focusing on, uh, is why that's the case and how some concrete things to do about it. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, Ms. Swens, thank you for your answers. Uh, while at the same time, I feel for you that that is what the answer is. So, I have to wonder if, like, well, how does that compare to just general, how do you feel about this 
that it generally, and, and not just during a holiday time. Hmm. Yeah, it's often going to depend on the demographics. I mean, it, it's really, uh, if I recall correctly, you know, there's a bigger disconnect in urban areas than rural. Um, which you'd think would be the opposite because population density would be, you know, greater in, in the urban, but no, um, which I, I mean, really, when you think about it, it's not too surprising given the fact that um, most people out in the so-called countryside are, already have other traditions and they have different socioeconomic issues that are going on there. So cities are, have really not been the greatest uh, invention of modernity, <laughs> but that's a whole other presentation, yeah. And then question number three, I actively seek to find uh, my own meaning in holidays. Um, uh, neutral sometimes and not at all, we're about the same around 15, uh, 13%. Um, the biggest one was some of the time I seek to find my own meaning, that was 36%, and 22% uh, said all of the time. I seek to find my own meaning. And uh, we're going to talk more about the whole meaning part of the holidays, which I'm excited about. All right. So, and then a uh, favorite holiday, uh, Christmas, just slightly edged over them, but I'm surprised Halloween didn't get way more than 12%. Come on. That's like the <laughs> best ever. My, my birthday was outvoted Halloween. Like, that's which I, I it's awesome. I, I love the fact that that many people believe that their birthday deserves to be its own holiday like that absolutely that that's a healthy ego right there yeah uh, you you that's awesome for me it's a close between halloween and my birthday that's like <laughs> i have a friend who has spent it has to be upwards of twenty five thousand dollars to do his whole area in, in halloween he's like he's the kind of people, you know thousands of people flow through it at halloween time it is freaking nice. amazing and he, he crashes like the week after Halloween. It's just like, oh, I, I bet. forget Christmas, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> so let's get into this, uh, David. You know, yeah. holidays traditionally for me have been, uh, especially Thanksgiving and Easter and Christmas, um, coming from a religious family, those have been really stressful. And um, I've, I've found ways that I've coped with it just by getting a book and going into the corner because um, the, the gatherings that you and I, we were talking about this earlier, the gatherings that my family would have would be like well over 60, 70 people. And it, it was not something I wanted to be a part of at all. And so I dread holidays coming up. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, you don't even have to be non-religious to dread it. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of what I'm going to refer to as social weight attached to holidays. You know, there's, you know, there's, um, you know, personal history. Uh, there's the history of the holidays themselves, uh, which have over the last several years definitely been getting uh, a lot of uh, various and different attentions. Um, Social cultural practices that can be controlling uh, or certainly felt to be as such uh, can be almost um, really oppressive. You know, from a you know social perspective, <laughs> like we were just talking before, you know, this about the sheer number of people who engage in, for instance, decorations without even really knowing that it has absolutely nothing to do with their religious, you know, holiday in in that sense. You know, the idea of a tree, you know, I believe Eric you pointed out, or I mean, it's no joke in. Um, somebody can, you know, look up the verse, but you know, it's like you are not to have a tree. Like it is a legitimate pagan thing to do, and yet it is standard shtick to have a Christmas tree. Um, so, you know, and this isn't this isn't to go into a whole lot of oh my gosh, hypocrites, um, because I mean the reality is is that um, you know many religious ideas are quite fungible. And that's why they last for a long time. Um, but it is fascinating to have people engage in so many different behaviors, use similar terminology. And as a result, people who are hearing one story attached to it, a story of oppression and a story of emotional manipulation and hurt and possibly, in fact, even likely rejection, 
for various ridiculous reasons, um, is you know, every time somebody mentions certain terms and certain ways of acting, those come along for the ride. So it's for most people, Christmas lights, Christmas trees are not just the things themselves. They are all the meaning and the history and everything else that comes along because mm-hmm. our brains don't ever get rid of things. So, you know, the, the emotional, you know, baggage uh, just comes along. And unfortunately, you know, that's part of just being human. Um, and is a little bit, it's definitely what we're going to be talking about as, uh, you know, one, having a better understanding of why that is, and then two, some concrete things to do to help uh, mitigate the effects. So, yeah. Cool. So set this up for us. What's, mm-hmm. uh, what's the first step here? So, I want to, you know, back up a little bit because I've been meaning, you know, talking about, you know, meaning itself, you know, what, mm. what is the purpose? <laughs> why, why do we care so much about words and make believe, you know, dates? Like, I mean, literally the whole, the entire experiences of all of this, every last piece is just the flim flam of conscious, imaginative, create, you know, constructions. You know, there's, it's not like we go and find, you know, Thanksgiving floating in the air and go, oh, wow, yes, we really need to have this in our life. I mean, it's literally a social construction. It could have been any other day. Um, we could have added any number of things to it. We mm-hmm. haven't. Um, you know, Christmas for that matter, you know, is obviously as, Anybody who's studied history whatsoever, um, yeah, Jesus, if in fact he even existed in some capacity, did not get born in December 25th. I mean, this is this is a you know made up thing for a lot of historical reasons, and yet even knowing that, so so many of people, particularly who leave you know the various faith traditions, they know some of the history. They've looked into it, may have even informed why they left. And yet, every time these holidays roll around, we find ourselves inundated with this internalized weight of all the accumulated meaning that has, you know, been thrust yeah. upon us that we learned. And so why? <laughs> why well, is this such a big deal? Well, I've heard that before, that... Uh... Jesus definitely wasn't born on December 25th. Why is that not real? What's, <laughs> I mean, eh, you know, I mean, there's 365 other days, point point two five other days that he could have been born on, but uh, why would December 25th or none of them? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not in the, uh, uh, in the camp of Jesus didn't exist at all, but um, it, I mean, it really, I, there is a history behind why December 25th was chosen and it completely escapes me right now. Um, but there were a lot of, you know, uh, sociopolitical reasons for it. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, historical analyses of why that occurred and well, we're studying cause it's fascinating. Like why, you know, why do we pick certain things for ascribing meaning to it? You know, this goes into, I mean, anybody really ponder memes or, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, products that have been, you know, shipped to us over the, over the years. I mean, literally Pet Rocks, probably my favorite example from I, the really, late 80s. I had a Pet Rock. <laughs> yes. It was named Gregory, just for the record. Yeah. You and named your Pet Rock? You did? That's awesome. What, what how... Wow, how did you not name your pet rock? <laughs> I had a pet rat. I didn't have a pet rock. Yeah. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's a rock. Literally, people paid money for a rock. For a rock. That you could that go was, and yeah. get in your backyard. I mean, it, it's just stunning. I mean, any the the initial uh, digital games, the Tamagotchis or whatever those stupid things were. I mean, people were having emotional <gasps> breakdowns when their pixelated creature died you know on these things and you're like 
oh my gosh, what, like, <laughs> why are we doing this to ourselves in particular? And so. <laughs> no, that's interesting that you say that because like growing up as a kid, I had a ton of stuffed animals and mm-hmm. um, I felt like they were their own. I, I, I wanted them to be real and I gave them each names and I kind of mm-hmm. played with them and a few of them I came up with back. In fact, <laughs> and we see this on, on uh, all over the social media. I, I had a hernia operation when I was like five or six and I took Fluffy in with me and uh, he had a hole in his side and the, the surgeon stitched both me and Fluffy up and we came out with the bandages <laughs> at the same time. And Very it, nice. It, well, it all right. So you, like, you did name your stuffed animals. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. I did. Fluffy. But but yeah. But it sounds like it's a similar phenomenon to the Tamaguchi and and the pet rocks and and mm-hmm. uh, things like that. Well, literally, any, pretty much anything we do. I mean, everything that we wear. The you know, from uh, you know uh, people wearing crosses for Christianity to you know mm. beads and so on. And none of this is to you know, say, oh my gosh, we need to get rid of all of these, you know, items or whatnot. I mean, maybe crosses. I've never understood the idea of wearing a torture symbol as a symbol of love. But, um, you know, it's really, it, it, it's inevitable that we're going to do this. <clears throat> and one of the reasons for this, and I've talked about it you know, a little bit before in a different presentation, is about this notion of prediction modeling. Habits, cultural habits, the meaning that we give to various behaviors and the items that ex, you know that get uh, the meaning attached to them are about um, cultural practices. And one of the th- reason, one of the things I recently you know had uh, you know pointed out when it comes to culture is that often we think of culture as this collection of various behaviors and actions and so on and so forth. And really, though, culture is a way of helping one another predict better what the people in your groups are going to do. Like it is a mechanism that helps reduce essentially cognitive load that allows us to go, you know, by and large, if I enter into this situation, I know from previous cultural experience to expect this colors and this behavior and these words and so on. So it allows us to do a couple of things with that. One, it allows us to maintain a a degree of consistency in knowing that what is going to happen next so that we can, um, you know, measure out our resources and, and, you know, have that, you know, sense of, uh, of solidarity and consistency with going, oh, my vision of the world is pretty accurate. Every time I step into, you know, a, you know, a bar, <laughs> you know, I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get, a, you know, certain smells. I'm going to get certain behaviors. I'm going to get certain expectations around that behavior and what people do and these things and so on. Or walk into a certain church and so on. Like all of these things are allowing us to kind of offload the concerns we have about change and buttress that anxiety with a lot of, uh, you know, prescribed behaviors that allow us to go, oh, we're, we're in this together, you know, kind of thing. And so it, they, they provide a way of going, okay, so the meaning we give to these practices then guides our conscious deliberation. It guides our ability to say, oh, okay, rather than getting, you know, bogged down with trying to figure everything out at every freaking moment of every day, instead, it's almost like it's a, it's a social cultural download. We just, oh, yep, thank you. Thank you for giving me this. Um, I don't have to think any, you know, much further about it. I'm just going to keep on doing it, which is why so many social cultural practices are done but if you were to look at the history of some of them, you will approach people about it. They're like, what are you freaking talking about? Mm-hmm. This is, of course, a Christmas tree is Christian. It's in the word Christmas. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, or right. you know, rings for weddings, not a Christian thing. 
you know, or, you know, it's, um, Bunnies and uh, eggs and Easter? That's a yeah, thing, bunnies right? and eggs. I mean, that's all. I never got thing. that. As a Catholic, I never got that at all. <laughs> well, I mean, what's the three basic things of, that, of which meaning is all about? It's the uh, fighting, uh, uh, fleeing, and the other F word. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, <laughs> everything. <laughs> bulls Fornicating. Down. Yeah, see, there you would go. Fornicating. So... You know, we have all these things in order to give us structure so it makes life a little more bearable so that we can reduce our anxiety and know that, wait a minute, if I, you know, um, I know at least in this area of my life what's going to happen next. I may not like it. I may not, you know, appreciate what's going, what I see coming next, i.e. the holidays, for instance. But at least I have an idea of what to expect about it. And so with this, um, you know, comes then this idea of group cohesion in the face of adversity. This is why we create uh, these practices. And and it could be the adversity from, uh, you know, another group. It could be an adversity from... Um, contrarian ideas, you know, we have a bunch of, you know, behaviors that we do depending on the group in order so that we never have to face uh, ideas that are contrary to our own. And, but it can also be the adversity of just existential dread, the idea of death itself, the fact that at some point we are all going to you know, slough off this mortal coral and move on. And we really have no freaking clue what is after. And so this allows us to um, have some kind of means of dealing with and not facing it. So (laughs) if anything, you know, holidays and the creation of all these things are is one ginormous avoidance strategy to deal with the fact that um, really what we're doing is just making up shit as we go along. Hmm. And if we can just say, but no, this has intrinsic meaning, this has, you know, deeper stuff, then we ignore the fact that really it's just all made up. Like we, you know, there were just, there were various peoples and things happen to catch on um, just like, you know, the, was it the TV show, um, was it Masquerade or The Family or something? It was a late 80s vampire show that lasted for all of 10 episodes. It was great, but it was before vampires became a thing in the grander, you know, Hollywood thing. And so it tanked. I mean, it was just, they had some great actors at the time, some pretty decent writing for its time. And boom, it just, it was about, I think it came out, like five or six years before the sparkly vampires. And, you know, <laughs> we, 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 can all, we can all really have a lot of problem with um, those movies, but they certainly helped usher in um, <laughs> a new golden age of uh, yeah, sparkly exploring age. all these things. Sparkles. Yeah, it's all about the sparkles. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so much of this, you know, when we really stop and, and look at why things catch on, why things... Um, you know, it, have the meaning they do. When we just pause for a moment, we realize we're just making it up. And sometimes that can be empowering. In fact, I would say that it is. At the same time, um, it can also be quite, uh, for lack of a better word, soul destroying when you realize that this doesn't really have more meaning than what collectively. Uh, whatever that may mean, the size of it may mean uh, that it uh, that it has. So you, know, you make a really good point because looking back, whenever I would show up to a holiday event, it would there always be the same thing. We'd always do the the same thing: um, presents around a tree, praying mm-hmm. over the meal, uh, maybe going to church or something like that. But uh, I I just continued to do it because mm-hmm. that's all I knew. That's what I was taught. I never um considered that that was kind of just all made up (laughs) and Mm -hmm. i was i didn't have to 
do that if I didn't want to. Yep. And what's powerful about those things, because this is not about getting rid of meaning. <laughs> One, good luck, not going to happen. Um, what it is, is taking a step back and being able to look at these practices in all of their various ways and looking at what they're trying to address. They're trying to address a, a intrinsic bone deep human need to, you know, find some kind of purpose and give structure to life. And, you know, so, I mean, you mentioned family stuff. I love hearing about, you know, family traditions because some of them are just like, how does this make any sense? Or, or, you know, or they happen to be very similar to others, surprisingly, or not at all similar. And yet, if you, you know, look back at them and go, okay, what was the purpose? And so much of what was about those predictive behaviors, knowing that, you know, uh, here's the anxiety about whether or not you got the present you wanted and how all this was going to be, you know, done emotionally. But you knew that you had a structure to the day ahead of you where you mm. did this and then this and then that. And here you are. And everybody just collectively gathered around and did it together and it was okay i mean <laughs> we had a thing about you know our family uh we had um stockings first then breakfast then major oh. presents and of course being the pain in the ass uh that i was and still am um you know as i got older i got into the habit of eating slower and slower the breakfast because until everybody was done, we couldn't go over and open up the major presents. And so it was just, it was just one of those things. Where it's like, I'm just going to eat my pancakes one little bite at a time. <laughs> you know, I, never under, I never understood my friends uh, who had their family traditions was to open presents uh, on Christmas Eve. Yeah, that, that, that made was like no almost sense a, a war, like between us. How could you do that? <laughs> well, and there you have it. Like you, you will, like you'll get into some. You know, some people start sharing some of these very individualistic family traditions, and people get downright pissed. Like, how dare yeah. you open presents? That you're not a true before? Christian. <laughs> like, are you freaking out of your mind? This is made up. Like. It, it, and that doesn't reduce the meaning of it. It just goes, it's also made up. Like, this is what we're just <laughs> doing together. And, so, <laughs> and, and, and part of that as, as well is also then to, um, one is, you know, one comment mentioned, you just never question it. And two, they often will occur for so long that we don't bother to look back and go, why did we start this in the first place? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like some families, you know, when you really start digging in, they're like, wait a minute, why did we start? Like we didn't, when we first started, we didn't open a present to the New Year's Eve. And then you start finding out that one year it was because um, I've heard from one family, um, you know, the, uh, the father, the younger family, the father got deployed on Christmas Day. Uh-huh. And they found out like three days before. And so it was like, hey, we're going to do this. And then from then on, it became a way of celebrating the fact that they cared, uh, they wanted to send off, you know, this experience and going, hey, we are willing to even break from tradition and make our own to, you know, provide mm-hmm. meaning for our own family. And, but then, but that only, <laughs> that only got remembered when they actually started talking about it together. You know, they, they were just like, well, no, this is what we've always done. And then somebody's <laughs> like, wait a minute, no, it isn't. Like, wait, why did that happen? And then all of a sudden it all comes out, which then adds to the, the weight of the meaning itself, actually. It's like, oh, well, shoot, let's really mm-hmm. remember this. This is why it was so important to us because we were celebrating, oh my God, you know, my father was leaving, you know, in, the, in this time and going off and we didn't know if he was going to survive. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. it's so many of these things that instead of removing them, we learn to really just start asking more questions about why they've come up. What is the mean behind it? What was the purpose? And then asking, maybe we can change it. 
maybe we can tweak it a little bit to make it our own. Maybe we can remember that really this is a universal attempt at dealing with you know, issues that we all are of not only existential dread, but community you know, uh, togetherness and the need to belong. And it all manifests in various ways, some of which 100% disagree with, um, but you know, they're you know, still addressing you know, very basic needs. So what's your experience with family, you know, two people who get married, who come from uh, families with very different traditions that are contrary to one another in that regard? How do they work that out? Uh, often poorly. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> like we open, we open presents on Christmas Day. We open presents on Christmas Eve. Now you have, you know, the husband feels one way and the wife feels the other and they have a kid. And, and that's where communication and, you know, it's a lot of, um, it's really those two things. One, recognizing that this is made up. And two, that simply because it is made up doesn't remove our capacity for feeling, you know, bigly about it. You know, it's, it really is, you know, because it's made up, in fact, it allows us the, the, the freedom to be able to find and highlight that this process of making shit up and, you know, in, in our meaning and purpose is what it means in many ways to be human. And so every time we're engaged in the meaning making process, we are engaged in exhibiting what it is to be human, what it is to, you know, be caught up in this strange world in existence that none of us actually asked. And maybe some of us had we been asked would have said, hell no, I'm waiting for the next time around. You know, I mean, it's just, it, we, were, we didn't ask and here we are. And so what are we going to do about it? And you know, it's, you know, it's something that, at least for myself, one way of looking at it is that it's a profoundly ethical practice to engage in, to look at this meaning-making process. Because, you know, was it uh, so from Mark Johnson, uh, Morality for Humans? Highly recommend this book. I have probably highlighted it before. <laughs> so, because um, it really is one of my go-to places for, for a comprehensive ethical system. But... You know, he, he notes that when we look at moral deliberation, you know, we're reconstructing our experience in a way that resolves the morally problematic situation that's confronting us. So such a process involves the only reasonable notion of transcendence available to humans, the ability to move beyond our current habits of thought and action to creatively remake some aspect of ourselves in our world. That is what we are engaged in, in the holidays, and in specific, but we're actually engaged in this every single day. But that is what we are actively engaged in. We are actively engaged in, as much as we are consciously doing so, remaking some aspect of ourselves and our world, even if it's our little world of experience that we're having right now. And that means then, um, yes, uh, somebody else um, noting uh, the moral landscape, uh, from Sam Harris, also excellent. Um, I actually consider Johnson and Harris's thing, they work quite well together. Um, so, but, um, uh, but that's what we're engaged in. We're, we're engaged in this practice. And when we do so as deliberately as possible, we start seeing just how much flexibility we have in doing this. When we start noting what we're doing, we start recognizing, oh, the thoughts that I've had about, I never questioned this. This is what I've always done. This is the meaning that I've, you know, that I've given to it. This is what shows up to me every single year around these stupid dates. I'm not even calling them holidays. They're just days that happen to be given an extra, you know, social weight to them. So when we realize that, we can start going, well, now what? You know, one practice that I have um, that I've done with some clients is to, uh, in particular, getting, getting out of, uh, you know, Christianity in particular, this also works for any, you know, religion of damnation, is to actively think about hell and picture the worst part of it and then replace the flames 
with gumdrops and <laughs> you know silly putty Does and that one. cotton candy i mean like waving cotton candy all around and you're going why i mean it's silly but that's actually kind of the point because the whole that, thing that, is silly yeah. I mean, <laughs> it turns out that uh, hell is is big rock candy mountain or something oh my gosh all the more reason to go there uh it's <laughs> yeah here it is but that's just you know, it. One it's of, the practice of, of actively choosing to consider and rewriting these stories. One of the, the, the statements I've just recently heard, which I really kind of like, is uh, traditions is peer pressure by dead people. Hmm. <laughs> what? Yep. What do you mean? Like, um, uh, 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 dead people are pressuring you to continue to to do these traditions. Are we talking about psychic mediums? I, I, I talked about this, Eric. <laughs> Don't believe what the mediums tell you about the dead people. Once we can, once I can kind of disconnect and say, hey, I don't have to do this. I'm not forced to do this. And on the flip side, I can start to make my own, make something that's meaningful to me. That seems very empowering, feels mm -hmm. empowering. Yep, it absolutely is. I mean, it's one of the reasons, and I'm wearing this silly, stupid hat that, you know, you know, and it's, I don't know if anybody can do it, but it's like, I've been naughty. I mean, it, it's an active participation in what, you know, growing up was a projection forward of Christmas into hell and damnation because Christmas was really a, uh, a, a, a pointer towards the inevitability of, you know, the torturous substitution of us. And <laughs> let me make Christmas great again. I love it. Um, <laughs> but, it, you know, it's having fun, poking at some of these wow. things and learning to just laugh at the absurdity because it is the whole practice of this is absurd when we get down to the brass tacks of just what we're doing. I mean, and, and, and it's, and the joy around finding that absurdity is in noting, well, wait a minute, that means I can do whatever the fornication I want. You know, <laughs> It's like, I can do this like, here. What do I want to do? I mean, you know, it's like, um, you know, somebody mentions, you know, crosses, turn those suckers upside down and they're not crosses, they're swords because you're waiting for the zombie apocalypse when we've used up all our bullets and we can't make any more. So we have to go. I know this was a plot line of a TV show, but <laughs> it was an awesome TV show for as long as it lasted. And now I can't remember the name of it but they had no more electricity and eventually they couldn't make any bullets. So everybody went back to sword fighting. It was awesome. <laughs> um, so anyway, tangent. Um, <laughs> I always have this fantasy of going up to somebody with a, a big crucifix on and saying, oh, I see you're a fan of the lowercase t. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why not? This, hey, this a, is a new tradition could be Christmas tea. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. I mean, okay. it, it's... <laughs> you know, it's like the whole, you know, whether or not it's, um, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you know, the, the, you know, the three, you know, big baddies, and you've got, um, you know, this notion of, you know, initially paradise being, you know, hills of flowing milk and honey, and you're going, of course it was, they were in a desert. Mm. Like, <laughs> This is not like this is this does not exactly stretch the imaginative bounds for the meaning of their cosmic, you know, belief to be about something to avoid what they're having to face day in and day out, which is the utter destitution and despair of death all around them in the in the form of a desert. I mean, it's just like. You, you have to wonder, you know, people who, um, in fact, actually, we don't have to wonder. We know. Um, we have stories of people who have, uh, you know, you know, em immigrated into, for instance, you know, the States and come from 
uh, the so-called third world countries, and they get taken to a to a um, uh, you know grocery store, and they're almost catatonic with choice overload. Because what do you mean you have fourteen different brands of butter? Just watched Moscow on the Hudson, an old Robin Williams film from 1984 mm-hmm. or thereabouts. And yes, it was an exact scene like that. The first yeah. scene of Moscow on the Hudson is he's standing on a line that looks like it's hours long to get coffee. And then you fast forward, he's in New York. He goes into a supermarket. He asks, where's the coffee line? And coffee line, it, it's, it's aisle four. And he goes down yeah. and the whole aisle and he's reading off the brand names of the coffee and he's almost passes out because he can't yeah. believe it. It, it, it is. It, it's utterly... It's, it's, it's astonishing just the degree to which, and again, speaking of behaviors that we just don't really think about. I mean, how often do we spend minutes pondering the Starbucks, uh, you know, uh, you know, menu only to freaking order the same damn thing that we ordered the last 10 mm-hmm. times? You know, it's like, it's this, false notion that what we're doing in deliberating on these things as if it adds anything intrinsic and it doesn't it's just things that we are using to avoid having to deal with the fact that well a lot of the stuff is just silly and if we just kind of all stood up and went yeah it kind of is, then who knows what could happen with it. So that kind of goes to kind of the traditions and like the, 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 the things that we do on holidays, but holidays are more than just traditions. Unfortunately, (laughs) from my point of view, we have to interact with a lot of people. Um, uh, there's there's family gatherings um, i think friends gatherings are a little different because that might be more welcoming than possibly a family's gatherings but uh so what do we how how, how would we kind of change our view or change our mm-hmm. tradition or how can i deal with my family when i show up and there's yep. 70 people and it's just overwhelming <laughs> absolutely so one of the things to, to kind of come forward from understanding that so many of these traditions, behaviors, and what we're doing is about organizing our resources for future, for future situations is this idea of body budgeting. And so imagine for a moment that you're, you know, about to, you know, embark on, you know, a D&D quest. Let's go with the nerds. And, <laughs> you know, and you're prepping. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Um, what do I need? Like the DM's going, here's the general idea of you know, the villains and so on you're going to have to deal with and, and so on. What do you oh. want? But you can only fit this much in your pack. What do you want to do? And you're like, well, you know, I need this and I need that. And I need, you know, a certain spell book and I need these number of potions, but I can't fit this many. So I need this. So if, imagine the holidays really anything, but since the theme here is holidays, imagine the holidays as that kind of quest. You have this, you know, um, you know, field before you filled with, you know, possible, you know, you know, socially created monsters and anxiety provoking situations. And you're going, okay, what do I need to mitigate? Like I can't, you know, go off to a rock and meditate for the next four months uh, because, you know, I have bills to pay. So I'm going to have to face, you know, these things to some degree. What can I do in order to, you know, mitigate the effect? So this is not a magic wand because this is an analogy, not real life. Um, we can't, you know, get rid of all these things. We're going to have to work our way through it. So as a consequence, uh, we're, you know, one way of looking at them then is we are going to organize our resources. Two, we start being more aware of environmental influences. So the things that we take for granted, if you're working in real, you know, in uh, 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 any kind of, um, you know, sales job, guess what? You may have been doing this for a long time. You may not even realize just how pervasive perhaps 
you know, the holiday music ha happens to be. I mean, how many freaking renditions of Jingle Bells can we have? But we do it, and it fades in the background. But just because it fades in the background doesn't mean it's not affecting us. You know, oh, I, not, I the, hate that. The, I hate it. I, I, I walk yeah. into a hardware store, and it's playing... Uh, you know, and, and and that's a part of it too. With Halloween, anxiety starts to creep mm -hmm. up because I know Mariah Carey is defrost, defrosting, <laughs> and she's starting yep. to warm up. Oh man! But yeah, you know, so I didn't even about consider that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I worked in a Baskin Robbins for six years in a mall, and of course, as soon as Thanksgiving, probably before Thanksgiving, they just started to play the music, and it was so loud. I never played Christmas music when I went home. Oh yeah, and it's that, so that's actually uh, I, it's something I hadn't con considered at all, David. Is that um, not only uh, is it just family gatherings, but it's also just kind of walking into public in general in, in a store. Oh yeah, I had not seen the wreaths, seeing the seeing the the lights. Um, you know, it's like, and it doesn't matter. Like the the maybe not ha ha funny, but funny and like you know Stephen King's it, clown funny. You know, it, it's, it's the amazing thing is that we don't actually know what the meaning is for any of the households that have any of these decorations up. We can assume, but we really don't. And statistically speaking, there are any number of families out there who have been putting up these lights and putting up any number of decorations, and they're not actually even believers. For all we know, we might be fought, you know, walking by an atheist house or a secular humanist house, and we don't even know it. But because the trappings of this have put on, you know, a certain meaning, and it's an automatic association, that we start getting, you know, this is where mm -hmm. triggering comes in. It's like, oh, shit, now what? And so, which is, again, why stepping back at times and realize these don't have any intrinsic meanings. They're just objects. We give them to it. And maybe the other person doesn't. So being aware of environmental influences, um, coping strategies that you have already started using, cannot emphasize this point enough actually, is that do not shame yourself when the coping strategies that you've used before aren't working as well. Mm. The reason for this is that what, it comes back to environment. Lately, I don't know if anybody is aware, but uh, we've been in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and there have been some social changes that have been happening. Uh, I swear this is like a, a, you know, a, a geopolitical conversation around going through puberty. Like hair is going to start growing in places that uh, you know, hasn't before. And I mean, it's really... <laughs> We almost have to have that conversation. Um, but we have been. <laughs> We've been in the midst of this yeah. colossal upheaval and then combine that with political upheaval. And you're just going, what the hell? So all of the, <laughs> thank you, Rob, for the mask. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and regardless of even where you may fall on all of this, the fact that it's so freaking confusing about everything I mean, it's like my wife recently, you know, uh, uh, did a plane ride back and visited visit the family. And, you know, the instructions are you have to wear a mask the entire plane ride unless, um, but you can, you know, hold on to it and lift it up if you're going to eat or drink water. Yes, because the virus goes, oh, wait, you're drinking now. I'm going to pause in midair and not enter. I mean, there are so many of these things that are just asininely stupid and we're engaging them be for any number of reasons. We get back to, you know, behavior that has meaning that really doesn't have any real purpose anymore. And it, but it comes back to, again, social solidarity it comes back to knowing what you're going to expect moving forward. So many of these practices we've gotten into, and it's going to be actually, I'm sure there's <laughs> going a little bit on a tangent here. But it's going to be a fascinating study to have for the next several years around the practices that continue that have been instituted over the last 18 months. And in fact, as um, a couple of um, therapists I follow who are 
um, uh, into you know, studied a lot of human sexuality have noted that um, it, there is some indication that uh, certain sexual peccadillos and like in and uh, proclivities for certain kinks uh, are based out of you know around that like you know pubescent era you know time of development and here you have an entire generation of the last couple of years now who have been um, wearing masks everywhere and he just was you know, speculating as the what the changes in various, uh, for that matter, interests in porn down the road, uh, and so on that people are going to have, um, and just all of these different practices that are going to, you know, kind of seep into you know various things. Anyway, psych is fascinating, and that's a whole other thing. Yeah, mass sexual fetish. There's already a lot there, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to peruse. Have some homework, peruse uh, Pornhub. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll include some of those in the references, some links to <laughs> <laughs> porn, the mask fetish videos in Pawn Pornhub. Yeah. You bet. It's really, it's really trying to get demonetized here on YouTube. Aren't you? <laughs> Jeez Louise. Uh, but, so we're, I, we're I do. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Boy, now you're just going to make the troll smashers work even harder with the next uh, couple Sorry. of Sorry. <laughs> But I love your analogy with the Dungeons and Dragons uh, 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 quest. At first, I'm thinking, "Oh my gosh, where is he going with?" But it makes perfect sense. Um, kind of like for me, uh, when I kind of did this as a kid and growing up, uh, when I would go to large family gatherings, I knew I had to bring a book and I had to bring a flashlight because number one, I would I would uh, read in a corner, and then number two, I would want to read in the car in the dark on the way home. And so those were like, that was what kind of got me through uh, and maybe a pair of swim trunks if there was a pool there. But um, uh, but uh, w- yeah. now that you're talking about like going into uh, stores or something, mm-hmm. I can totally th- see, like I could bring a pair of headphones with me and yep. uh, put on some of my own music uh, and then kind of take them out when I want need to talk to, to someone. Uh, but I really, I really like that. Uh, I, I like that that concept of okay, what do I what resources do I need to have? What do I need to prepare for? Yep. And this is where we get into we look ahead and we plan flexibly. You know, it's about you know taking one, just simply acknowledging that we cannot have 100 percent control over our environment, both internal and external. So therefore, stuff's gonna come up, difficulties are gonna arise, and we're gonna have to deal with them. This is Stoicism 101. I mean, this is what we're going to have to work through, you know, stuff. So, in fact, Eric, you're, you're raising some great examples of uh, what I'm about to mention. So we're going to go through four uh, tactics to, um, you know, that can be flexibly applied and figure out how to address some of this stuff going on. One is maintaining diet and exercise. And by diet, I do not mean get on the next fad, get onto the latest TikTok crap and so on. Um, You know, just for a second, I thought there couldn't be anything created that was worse than Twitter. TikTok nailed it. But anyway, um, (laughs) I'm probably showing my age a little bit there. But anyway, uh, yes, the internet always finds a way. Thank you for the comment. Um, And so... The so maintain diet and exercise, and what I mean by that is, um, as much as <laughs> as much as you want to indulge, it really isn't going to help the emotional living going forward. It really isn't. Um, oh. If you are, you know, your body again. This is about body budgeting. This is about getting, you know, preparing for the things that are going to be coming next. And if your body's used to eating a particular way and having an exercise program that is at a certain level, when we start dropping those off, which is a common practice around the end of the year holidays, that is a huge contributor to all of the additional weight, emotional weight that is happening. Because not only do we have to deal with the things that we can't not deal with, but then we're reducing the resources that we've been building up 
to deal with these things. Okay. So all the, which is of course, part of the difficulty is because so many of the social practices around these holidays is to do the very things that undermine our ability to deal with <laughs> You know, somebody mentioned, you know, in comments around, you know, childhood indoctrination. Really, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it can be helpful to look at every single cultural practice as indoctrination of some level. Literally, what? every Wait. single thing we do is some layer of indoctrination. It's just trying to indoctrinate us in one direction or another. And it depends, the only variation is the, is the kind of um, the negative or the, the punishment that gets put on non-acquiescence, uh, really. I mean, it's really, is, all it is is variations in, uh, well, you know, you can, you know, kind of not do this and it's not going to be a big deal uh, in one circle. But if you don't do it in another circle, whew, complete ostracism. Uh, if you do this in a, in a different one, great. Now you've got tons of support and so on. I mean, it's really, you know, it, it's a bit melodramatic, I'm getting that, but it can be helpful to start looking at all of these things of what we're doing as essentially a way of, you know, controlling and thinking, making, you know, putting ourselves in a particular mindset, in a particular way of viewing things. And that's it. I mean, this is, for that matter, this is, uh, uh, and, you know, memetics, uh, you know, one-on-one uh, for anybody who's, you know, studied that. Um, it's really, kind of, oh, yeah. Kind of going back to the beginning, it, it sounds mm-hmm. like these things are, this indoctrination is making things predictable. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. That's and, it. And, um, Ultimately, that's its purpose. It just depends on the, predi- the what, it's, what it's wanting. The result you're predict. looking for. Yeah. Is based is the ideology and the 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 group that uh, has these practices you know built up. You know, it's you you walk into you know like, why do you not fart in a funeral? <laughs> because you know because it's not you know or belching. What? Some cultures to belch after a meal is a, is considered hey this is that's awesome. It showed that you, this was an amazing meal. And others, oh my gosh, how freaking rude can you be? You know, to um, even talk about, you know, sex at all in some, you know, in some, you know, cultures is totally fine. In others, eh, anathema. And of course, historical, um, you'll have changes in that. I mean, we, we've gone from table legs being considered a, you know, almost fetish to, you know, now you can go into basic cable and, you know, uh, was it, they've gotten caught up on, um, uh, don't judge, uh, Riverdale, the TV show. And you literally have these 20 something year old actors portraying themselves as teenagers, engaging in any amount of sexual activity. And you're going, well, wait a minute. If they were actually, we'd all be going to jail watching the show. But it's selling a fiction, and what is that? I don't know. But you know, any number. You know, there's any number of issues around all of this. But the the reality is, is we've gone from you know, only a couple hundred years ago of you know these various you know furniture issues being you know too much of a problem to now this is just so common. And, and what are we doing about it? How does this work? This isn't a whole like anti-sex thing, but it's just, you know, we have variations in this. Um, going back to uh, the, the the getting prepped for these events, mm-hmm. I kind it just yeah. kind of hit me like not only should we prepare with our physical things, like for example, me, a book and a flashlight, but also the conversational, the interactions, the, I think um the, or even and even maybe the emotional stuff that we might experience like okay so uncle roy is going to come up to me and say ah that biden guy huh he's doing a horrible <laughs> job and so uh, you know those kinds of things i would also need to prepare myself like how am i going to respond to that what what would i feel comfortable res- do i want to engage with him is there a, is there something i can say that can maybe deflect it and then um uh just realizing okay 
I'm going to get overwhelmed. Uh, and, and I'm going to just know that going into it. <laughs> so it's more than just the physical things is, is yes. I can stuff my backpack with, with, um, uh, uh, topics of conversation maybe, or, or ways to divert, uh, questions I don't want to, uh, answer or topics yep. I don't want to discuss. How about that Absolutely. government trying to make everybody get those Bill Gates microchip uh, fluids into their body? <laughs> or even, I, um, okay, it, I know they're going to be praying at the table and uh, that's not something I want to do or participate. How am I going to handle this? So here we go. So uh, we'll go to third and back to two. So find the shared meaning. Um, even, you know, I've already mentioned this a bit before, but even the most religious person is still eh, human and therefore they're interested in connecting social practices to consistency. So if we look at the prayer activity as just an activity that we give, that each and every single person around that table is giving meaning to it that there is nothing intrinsic to the idea of, you know, doing this or crossing self or, you know, thank goodness Jesus wasn't hung because then he'd have to do like this. So we have, <laughs> um, but you know, once we were able to step in and go, wait, wait a minute, this is like, this is literally just people putting themselves in a certain physiological state in order to, in mouthing words do I have to, or can I pause for a moment and go, this is just another practice to find solidarity with the people around them and um, find some kind of consistency in their life. Even if it's only in this few, you know, these next few moments, that's all this is. And this doesn't remove, I want to be careful here. This does not remove any trauma that people have gone through. It does not remove um, the negativity of how certain practices have been applied and so on does not remove any of that. What it does is provide a, at least initial blueprint to move on from the idea that these, we have to accept and hold on to the, the meaning that we have been given about these things. We don't. There's absolutely no necessity for us to continue agreeing or acquiescing to the meaning that we were given around basic just bodily actions. There is no necessity to this. We have the capacity to be able to say, guess what? That was fornicated up and I'm going to you know, do something else about this. And yes, and I realize it's not, it's, it's more complicated than that and it takes practice, but the reality still is, is that when we can start separating the behavior from the meaning, we can start inserting our own and in fact, even finding some commonality, even with the family members that we otherwise uh, would like to have nothing to do with. And uh, we're kind of stuck with for the next few hours until we can, you know, find a book to read in a corner to read it in. So can you, yeah. can you say that again, if, if we can remove the action from the meaning, you said it really well. Say it. If we can separate the behavior from the meaning, you know, in the way that it, in the, the uh, structure okay. that I use for therapy, it's separating the behavior from the story or the narrative. We do, okay. behavior does not automatically, or rather, let me rephrase that, does not necessitate any particular story about it. Stories are automatic. Why to rephrase? They will come automatically, but there's no necessity for one story to be it. Like, and we know this from even since you know sex keeps coming up. You know, it's we know this from our own uh, you know evolution away from looking at sexuality as an awful thing that can only be made pure inside of holy matrimony. The reality is, is that we can reshape and the behaviors themselves do not have to have that story. We can put something else there. We can make something, frankly, far more beautiful out of this. Because we have that capacity, because we're human. Yay, go us. We can do this. It almost sounds like you're 
you're hijacking the us humans uh, uh, meaning making machines as meaning making machines you're hijacking that mm -hmm. and, and putting it back into our own control yep we can't I mean, really <laughs> it's a little long, you know um but mental health and 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 making and and helping facilitate uh our better better not perfect but better life really is about learning the processes that we cannot change about our how our human mind works and reusing them in ways that are better we are not going to stop the capacity for us to make meaning it's just not going to happen okay. any more than we are going to stop uh our capacity for bias because it's it is hardwired to think certain things in a simplistic way what we can do is become aware of these processes and help mitigate um, how we you know, use these things. Same thing, for instance, with body budgeting. We're not getting rid of this process. <laughs> We're, it is not going to go away. It is baseline physiological. This is how things work. Um, and so we're not going to be able to transcend how our bodies work with things. So instead, let's use the hell out of it <laughs> in a way that makes more sense, that helps us live better lives and gets us away from the utter bunk that far too many of us, one, grew up with and are still surrounded by. So let's you know, have fun with it. I like that because my initial reaction might be, oh, this mechanism isn't working for me, so I need to get rid of it. But you're, but that's obviously impossible to do. So instead, you're kind of saying, this mechanism, if it's not working for you, find a way to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's 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 again, that's freeing. That 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 feels like I'm no longer locked into my past behavior. Like mm -hmm. I have this control over it. Yep. And in fact, we do this with our bodies quite often. I mean, the, all of the science behind macros, uh, you know, really what, are, what happens for instance- Mac Macros? Uh, macros, it's a, it's a, a, a nutritional thing. Um, where- oh, macronutrients, okay. Yes, and, and or um, for instance, uh, you know, hell for that matter, diabetes. So what we're dealing with, with medical technology when it comes to diabetes is using the body's own systems to do and create something different. That's, that's really what we're doing. We're hijacking this process and going, we can do something different with this. And so, so much of, and all we're doing is just expanding that to, you know, the, the mind, you know, the, the mind body, you know, issue. Okay. That's really what we're doing. And so part of that then is, so we're finding the shared meaning, we're reducing struggles. So we know things are coming. And so we're gonna maintain the things that are already working for us. And then we're gonna reduce struggles. If we know that there are mountains coming in our journey, why are we gonna go, you know what? That path over there, that's totally how it would usually go, but it's like this steep, but there's one over here that's this steep. I'm gonna avoid that because I've always done this one. Why? You know, why, why bother? So this means, in fact, hey, guess what? Maybe step back from social media. Mm. You know, this isn't a whole like social media is evil, although much of it is. Um, you know, it's not even that, you know, um, it, it's some big thing about it. it's hijacking our dopamine systems because it's not quite um, how that's working. But it is about when we take stock of, it could be social media, it could be any number of things. Take stock of the things that you typically are finding yourself being emotionally drained or incensed by and dial it down a couple notches for the next three months. Just <laughs> dial it down. Like, you know, if you're on, you know, you're doom scrolling through Facebook and, you know, three hours a day, maybe reduce it to two. And, you know, it's about understanding that we have limited resources and environment is changing during this time of holidays. So therefore, let's reduce the, the activities that are draining us. Mm. That in a different situation, 
we could totally handle. We were fine. Like, whatever. Give me the Facebook. Just, you know, inject it. But now in this process, it's, you know, the threshold has been lowered because of the changes in the social environment, which means we need to take stock of that and reduce some of the things we're doing. Take time off if possible. You know, if you have that capacity, do so. You've been saving it up all year because guess what? You probably didn't go on vacation at all because who was going anywhere? Um, but now use it. Even if it's only, you know, you know, still being around, you know, local, at least you're no longer inundated by just the mentality of, all oh, right, I have work to go. You know, focus on solid friendships. You know, the ones that are... Oh continuing and been supportive instead of um, figuring out, well, gee, um, how many new connections can I make over the next two months in this, in, in a dozen parties? It's maybe I go to only six parties and on my off time, I'm really doubling down on, you know, the connections that have been tried and true and supportive because again, the environment that we're in, has reduced the thresholds for what we're able to cope with, which means that we need to take stock of what else we're doing. And the old behaviors that used to be fine are now you know, gonna cause some problems and coping techniques that we used to use that were fine are no longer meeting uh, the needs that we have in this time. This is a time crunch that we get into you know, January, February, and you know, it's fine. I love that because to me, I'm envisioning like uh, the computer that I'm working on has limited resources. So open up the task manager, close the stuff you're not using to, because you're about to launch a big game that's going to suck up all the resources. And uh, and so I love that. I never, ever considered that. So like uh, reduce your time on social media or, or um, get out into, if I, if you like, going on hiking or trails or walking mm -hmm. or, or uh, animals get out and get more of that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I love that. I, I, I never thought about that. That's, that's pretty darn take, cool. Take up a new creative enterprise, new creative behavior. Like it, it can be silly. Take up uh, finger painting, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, you know, um, you know, if I swear, it's one of the reasons I, I recently got back into photography and a lot of it is about expressing yourself differently, seeing the world in a, in a, in a different way so that you can access, access the flexibility of recognizing, I don't have to see things the way that I thought I needed to. Every single, again, coming back to every single idea in cultural practice is some form of indoctrination. When we start, you know, kind of looking at that things that way, we start going, wait, do I want, I mean, even asking the question, even the most trivial of things we look at and it's like, do I want to be indoctrinated by that? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it's oh, silly, wow. but hey, you know, it, it makes it that much more, it gives us, brings to a greater awareness just what's going on. And even if we can ask this question of everything, because we have limited time, um, we can at least ask it a few times to go, wait, what are the things that I'm doing? What are the stories that I'm telling that I don't actually need to perpetuate? These are just things that I was told. That's it. Okay. Now, this, this, these kinds of tactics they're not, they're not like a flip flick of a switch, a flip of a switch mm -hmm. at all. This is, this sounds like it's going to take practice. Um, and it also sounds like when I show up, I'm going to screw up somehow. I'm not going to mm -hmm. nail it on the first time. And so no. are, should I, and I like, I'm kind of asking a leading question. Should I give myself <laughs> some grace if I do yes. get messed up, but then just recognize it for next time? Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is, this is where it comes back to don't shaming yourself about how, you know, coping strategies you've used before are no longer working as well. It has nothing to do with there being anything broken or, you know, bad or di even diagnosable about you. 
I mean, this, this is, you know, I get this a lot with clients going, um, I've just been feeling overwhelmed recently. What, 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 what did I catch? You didn't catch anything. Like this is, <laughs> you're, you didn't suddenly, like depression isn't floating around for you to like ingest it or inhale it. You know, this is, you know, it's like asking the question of somebody who, um, you know, is, is standing in front of their house that just burned down and uh, all of their possessions are gone and their family dog perished. And they're going, how do you feel? Well, I feel pretty darn upset and depressed right now. Oh, well now, that must be, you know, some kind of issue going on. No, it's not. It's just that you're reacting to a really shitty environment. And a lot of what's going on is we are reacting to environments that are not conducive to uh, you know, working through things uh, as in the way that we used to. And couple that with this notion that um, any moment of um, feeling down or adversity or whatever must mean that there's something wrong with us. And suddenly we're trying to pathologize every single negative feeling mm. that we have. It's just a reaction to everyday crap. And if we can step back from and go, I don't need to, and yes, it does take practice. And sometimes we will get sucked into it. Um, sometimes we will still, you know, one of my... <laughs> One of my go-to practices when I'm feeling depressed, even with I, I know 100% that this is not going to help me out, is to go get a, uh, a bag of you know, snake gummies, and I will chow down that entire freaking bag. I don't care. I will just do it because I will have that momentary fix of feeling better, even though I know it's BS and I'm going to feel bad later when I have a stomach cramp. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I know this. And so and I've been, you know, I've been knowing this for years. So we still do this. But again, when we find ourselves doing that, we non shamefully go, ha, all right, hit the gummies again. And now what am I going to do next? I mean, uh, it's just, give me the gummies. <laughs> Those are delicious though. <laughs> they are. I mean, I mean seriously. Yeah. They, yeah. They really, uh, now I'm going to have to go get some, but you know, <laughs> but it, you know, the, when we find ourselves falling down, I mean, it, it really is, it, it is the cliche of like, and you have to get yourself back up, but there's some truth to it because you know, the reality is, is that we're in <laughs> CBD gummies. Ooh, there we are. Um, <laughs> funny story. Anyway, um, I'm going to go on that tent. But, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's when we figure out that even the story that we have about, in fact, the we shouldn't have done this, that itself is a story. We don't actually have to perpetuate it we can look at it and go, oh, well, thanks for showing up again. I'm gonna move on to the next one and see if the next time around, because it will be a next time, um, that I can take the knowledge that I've gained. I can acknowledge as well that I am a different person by itself necessity because I have the past as it continually collapses into our imagined future. And so our, who we are is constantly changing and growing. We can take what has come before and go, what do I want to do next? And maybe just shift the possibility, even a tad will open us up to a number of different ways of reacting and being. And even if it's dealing with family. That sounds, that sounds hopeful. Sounds also empowering too. Yeah. Um, so to summarize, it's kind of like, um, all right, so prepare for what's going to happen. Like think about it beforehand, prepare for what's going to happen. Um, work on maybe limiting what, what you, what's going on to conserve your resources. Um, and then 
you can make your own meaning uh, mm -hmm. out of what you're experiencing and how you're seeing things, whether it's a new tradition or an old tradition. Um, is, is that about to sum it up? Pretty much. Yeah. Hmm. It really is just exactly that. I mean, we're, we are, you know, taking a look at um, breaking it out even further. It's maintain the things that help, reduce the things that don't, <laughs> and uh, look for the shared meaning and everything. I'll, I'll be perfectly If you really want to tack on a fourth one, recognize that you're the one choosing what the meaning is going to be anyway. So have fun with it. <laughs> um, the as I began to kind of pull away from my extended family and there would be fewer and fewer and fewer people at these holiday gatherings, I started to enjoy the holidays more and more. Like, and, and when I started to kind of become independent and uh, uh, be able to drive around by myself um, and celebrate with some friends, that became more and more enjoyable too. Uh, I do, I love the part of what you said, reducing the, the stuff you don't like and increase the stuff that you do like. That's, yeah. I, I could see that that's kind of how I naturally did it. And I got some great results out of it. Uh, yep. That's cool. I, I've honestly found myself, I mean, there was a couple of weeks ago, I ended up, um, uh, I've also started doing some very non-professional DJing and, uh, and, you know, I was asked to do basically holiday music for this, you know, lighting um, they were, you know, uh, putting lights on in this local park. And a lot of the, you know, so-called Christmas songs are, I mean, when you really kind of look at it and some of the historical, you know, fundamentalist meaning, um, not a big fan, <laughs> quite disturbing. And yet there is, um, over the years, even, even with some of those finding out that in finding my own meaning in some of these and just even if it's not the meaning in the words themselves because some of it's quite atrocious is remembering that feel of solidarity that feel of connection that feel of the tears that inevitably flowed during the holiday services and yes i can totally jettison the fear and damnation and that kind of bullshit but I can still appreciate that the laughter and the hugs and the just sheer joy of being around other people in mm. a shared, you know, uh, a community yeah. is just at that level is a beautiful thing. Even if I unequivocally condemn, <laughs> you know, some of the, the ideas behind it, it's still... I don't have to throw everything out and can still appreciate the fact that, you know, the veneer that is being thrown on human experience can be awful, but the human experience doesn't have to be. Perfect. David, thank you so much. I mean, I came into this kind of uh, anxious, but a little hopeful, uh, you know, cause I, I, I struggle. It's, it's dark for me during these holidays, but you've given me some, some tools and kind of a, a ray of lights that I can um, use and, and make make these holidays better and better every every single year as I'm getting more and more used to working this way. Well, thank you for that. I really, really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, we have got uh, one, well, we got a question. And if you've got some mm -hmm. questions, folks, uh, type them in the chat, both here and over at Atheist Community Discord. Rob, you wanna take the first question? Yes, thank you, Eric. So um, the, the person asked, and this is sort of personal because a lot of my family is religious and I've been in this circumstance and never know quite what to do. So they asked, is it okay to excuse yourself from meals when people are about to pray? That is, ooh, that is going to be a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm not trying to do a cop-out answer. It really, um, you know, it's going to be... Um, really how so instead of answering that particular scenario instead we can apply some of the points that we were just discussing so if that's a behavior that you are thinking about doing so essentially you've looked at the situation you go you know what 
the only way that I think that I can deal with this is just by excusing myself. Like I just, I have to remove myself from it. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Your decision. Plan ahead. You know, don't be, uh, don't make that. And, you know, when everybody's about to do this, go like, so <clears throat> peace out. You know, <laughs> likely not going to be all that helpful. Um, instead, bring it up ahead of time uh, and just go look. You know, uh, I appreciate the fact that you all, you know, want to do this. Um, but it's not something that has the meaning that you have in it. Um, I feel uncomfortable and I just like to step out. And maybe instead of even stepping out, it's uh, maybe a change can be made where the prayer happens and you actually step in afterwards. You know, so hell for that matter, you can even see the prayer as a um, declaration for your entrance. So, <laughs> I mean... Again, and this comes back to the story making. I mean, look at it. Oh, they're bowing their heads because I'm about to enter the room. I mean, Amen, indeed. Here I am. <laughs> what a great introduction, folks. I'm, you're probably wondering why I called you here tonight. <laughs> and I have some new commandments for you, by the way. Exactly. Boy, have I have a deal for you. If you get five people to sell this widget, it's gonna, you're gonna make a ton of money. <laughs> That's awesome. Granted, you, know, one of the... you don't have to say that story out loud. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things I like to do is I just like to keep my eyes open and look around the room. Uh, and, and it's kind of interesting to see who else has their eyes Oh, open. yes, that, that yeah. is wonderful. And they're looking like, yeah, like this is stupid. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna talk to you later. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Yeah. Um, before we kind of wrap up and conclude, um, uh, for, well, firstly, we have a hangout. Do you have some time mm -hmm. to kind of hang out with us afterwards? Yeah. Great. Uh, before we conclude, do you have any, um, any final thoughts, anything that you wanted to say that you I didn't say during the, the discussion? Um, really cannot emphasize enough that, what we're doing all the time is our own meaning making process. Mm. Like it's, it's there. The idea of creating narratives is overdone. Like, I, <laughs> so I'm going to get on that kind of bandwagon, but the, the reality, this thing is, is that um, it is what we're doing. We're all in this trying to, to not even make sense of things, but, apply a structure that we then declare makes sense. And when we just simply step back and, and recognize that all of us are in the same boat of, of making stuff up as we go along, it really can be a source of just laughing a lot more because mm. Pretty much 99% of what we do in life is really kind of ridiculous. Um, and we might as well just, you know, have fun with it. Um, because, yeah, we're, none of us are getting out of this alive. So uh, let's, let's have, have some fun. Yeah. Um, in fact, was it, I remember um, the, there was a uh, Christmas claymation video when I was a kid. Um, and claymation, man talk about artistic genius to, to do with that stuff. But, uh, but there was this thing about where there was a talking horse or something and they came across, um, you know, the, he ended up getting completely drunk by the end of this. It was a children's thing, but anyway, um, but he was completely, you know, uh, in fact, I think it was a dog donkey. So the fact that he was drunk off his ass was probably an adult <laughs> level of humor that um all like the kids completely missed didn't you know didn't get <laughs> but, um but it was you know uh maybe both um but it, it was you know it was basically like blessing wine and it was just like yeah i went around and like i'm celebrating this and i'm celebrating this so let's you know or it was wassail um, it was this word that he was he was giving. Let's wassail our way to you know basically getting drunk, and it was just you know yeah this is absurd. So I'm not advocating getting drunk, 
I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, just saying. Have some fun with it. Yeah. David, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, folks, that's going to wrap up this discussion, and uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to um, closing this out. We've got a very special person that I tease at the beginning who's going to tell us uh, what her thoughts are. But um, you may have thought, oh, man, the holidays are going to come around. They're not going to do this again. They're going to take a break for the holidays. No more R4X for a, a month. But that's not the case. This is not going to be the last one for a while. In fact, we have another one coming up next week. And next week, we're bringing back Tora Bontrager, and she is going to talk about her foundation, the Amish Heritage Foundation. So this is going to be another RFRX Foundation Spotlight. The Amish Heritage Foundation is a history-making nonprofit committed to empowering Amish women and children through education past the eighth grade so they can choose their futures. We um, They provide services to the Amish people like cultural literacy training to various agencies, institutions, and individuals, as well as public awareness behind the, or about the crisis um, hidden in Amish society. Uh, they envision that one day education will be a constitutional right for everyone in the U.S., and Amish children will have the right to learn beyond the eighth grade, including the right to learn about STEM, the science, technology, engineering, math, civics, law, philosophy, and the arts. So that's going to be same time next week, same uh, place here as well. Uh, so Rob, what else have we got on the, the list here? Well, so um, if you've missed any of our previous 80 or so RFRX meetings, they're all on YouTube now, about 80 of them. Um, two of yours truly, and four of David, soon to be five when Eric gets that one up. And um, I, I should also let you guys know that any comments or questions you have for uh, RFR can be sent to the email address, which will be posted. And also you can find our blog, which was previously mentioned, uh, on, which is on medium.com. And also we have a podcast, which actually is several iterations. Initially, there were hosts which actually talked about certain topics and maybe interviewed people. Uh, as of late, they're the audio recordings of the RFRX uh, presentations. Yeah, in addition to that, um, we are all over social media. And if um, you kind of like what we're doing here and want to help out, um, following us on social media, interacting with us on social media, um, commenting on social media, it really, really helps us kind of uh, get the word around and, and stuff like that. So that would be fan greatly appreciated if you have the um, ability and the time to do so. I've got some links down there in the uh, chat. Um, and also we've got a newsletter. It comes out every someday and it has some great stuff in it, like upcoming news about RFR, uh, recent uh, resources, uh, resources from recent RFRXs, um, recent published videos and recent published blog posts as well. So I'm going to drop a link if you want to sign up for the newsletter. Now, I am uh, going to start a poll because I want to hear your thoughts about this program and uh, how it affected you to help uh, some of our future programming. Um, but while that is running, I would like to bring on our amazing, our fantastic, our indomitable executive director of Recovering from Religion, Gail Jordan. Gail, hello, and how are you doing? Hi, Eric. It's so good to... <laughs> It's so good to see you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And David, thank you for a fabulous presentation. You have given us so much to talk about. I know that you see Glenda and I are in the same room and we were muted and we were talking back and forth the whole time because we have a we have a conservative religious background and so many of these things were relevant to where we are. The the meaning that used to be associated with that what we have to do to deal with that and where we want to go with what the meaning is anyway it was a wonderful presentation and eric and rob did their usual wonderful job of um of hosting and thank you to our troll stompers who weren't too terribly busy but we're always glad to have them here and to everyone who has attended thank you for coming every time i do this uh it's almost always eric who gives me the introduction and he's always just um he's always been so generous with his compliments and his kindness and now tonight i'm going to kick it back one of the things that we can do in this time of of holidays but all of the other times is to find a support group 
I can't tell you the importance of that. I can't tell you how meaningful it is to be able to, uh, we know the value of talk therapy and talking things through and understand that our, our support groups are peer support. Initially, they were divided by region, by cities. We would have them established by that. And yes, they still go that way, but because we're meeting on Zoom, because we're still meeting on Zoom because, due to the pandemic, you can hop onto anyone and you could, you could likely, I, I don't want to put Eric on the spot, but you can find one almost any day of the week, mm -hmm. uh, almost any time zone. Look at the support groups tab on the Recovering from Religion website. If you'll hop in, sometimes these are not, you may not know anybody in there, but that's often what the group is. It's, it's people who are recovering from religion and have a need to talk it through, have a need for peer support. And Eric has done a fabulous job of gathering these groups together and scheduling these meetings. And so let me add that layer of icing onto all of the things that David said tonight about how we go about finding our own meaning, participating in a support group. And, and I'm going to kick it back to Eric and ask him to tell you a little bit about the possibility, and Eric, I am putting you on the spot, of there are some holiday-specific support groups that we're working on, support group meetings that we're working on. So I'm going to have Eric tell you a little bit about that. And thank you again, everybody, for coming. Well, Gail, I appreciate that unexpectedly. But uh, um, yes, uh, she is correct. One of the things that we're working on, one, one of the things we did last year is we had a support group meeting on Christmas Eve. There was an, a volunteer who was amazing at uh, hosting this meeting for us. He had the time and the willingness to host a meeting both on Christmas Eve and on New Year's Eve as well for folks who don't necessarily have some place to go or just needed to talk. We're going to work to do the same thing this year. Uh, here in the U.S., Thanksgiving is coming up, and we are having a Thanksgiving uh, meeting that has been posted in all of the United, the, all of the groups in the United States. And so, if you find a support group meeting somewhere in the United States, there will be this meeting uh, listed in it. Um, and uh, then we're looking to get a volunteer, a support group leader who is uh, has the time and the um, inkling to do it again on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve as well. And so um, if that's something you're interested in, join one of the, the uh, support groups in, uh, on Meetup. Um, look for it on the, the Meetup calendar um, or even in the Eventbrite uh, for the RFR support groups Eventbrite um, listings as well. Uh, look for those two meetings there as well. So yeah, thanks, Gail. Mm -hmm.